Farmhouse friends, welcome back to another Farmhouse Adventure. We are having a great time on the farm today. If you are new here, my name is Kim and this is Bloom Hill Home and Garden where it's all about the home and all about the garden. Homesteading, a natural home and a whole lot of DIYs. So thanks so much for coming along. To all my friends, it's great to have you back at the farmhouse. And if you hit subscribe, you will be here at the farmhouse more often. And if you ring that little bell, they will let you know what we're doing next. It's our season, guys, and you don't want to miss out on anything. When we first moved here a few years ago, we had several homesteading goals or a little bucket list, if you will. And one of those things we quickly found out that we were probably just going to have to pass on. It wasn't likely that we were going to be able to make it happen. But just a few days ago, I was talking with my awesome nephew, Matthew, and he let me know that we do have the resources to make that happen. Now, I'm a little embarrassed to tell you this, but 35 years ago, I took horticulture. I have a great love of the outdoors and gardening, and it's my first love. I love it, and I took horticulture. And in that class, we had to do tree identification. And you had to do the tree identification in the dead of winter because it's so easy to tell a tree by its leaves. But in the dead of winter, when there's no leaves, it's really difficult. And that's when you know you can really master identifying trees. Now I took that test and I aced it. And that was 35 years ago. A lot of information went in and a lot of information went out. So when we bought this home, there is a lot of mature trees and I was sure that some of them were maple trees. But when the spring came, we realized they weren't. 90% of the trees on our property are box elder trees and they are not a favorable tree. A lot of people will take them out, cut them down off their property as soon as they realize they have them. Now they're a weaker tree, they are prone to pests and disease, they break off easily, there's always lots of limbs falling. They don't grow in a great habit, they're not perfectly straight most of the time, and their leaves are not that pretty, they don't add a whole lot to the landscaping, and they attract those infamous box elder bugs. And we have a huge population of those in the early spring as well. Needless to say, I was super disappointed that we didn't have a lot of maples. And for the last three years, I've completely disregarded tapping trees for maple syrup, which was one of our bucket list items that we just had to do. But in that recent conversation with my nephew, he reminded me, and how I forgot, I don't know, but I did forget that a box elder is a species of a maple and you can make maple syrup with a maple tree and so it's not a sugar maple and a lot of people just assume that a sugar maple is the only maple which you can get syrup from but there are several varieties of trees that you can get syrup from there is birch there is black walnut there is maple and there is box elder and box elder is a species of a maple tree and it does have a lot of the same characteristics it has the opposite branching it has the little whirly gigs i don't know what you call them but those little whirly gigs helicopter thingies that fall on the ground and that's their seed packet it has those as well and so we have an abundance of box elder and so we are going to have an abundance of maple syrup so now that we're all in we gathered our supplies we got these buckets from the walmart bakery for a dollar each so they are food grade they were clean and then we got our food grade tubing and spiles from tractor supply our research showed us that the tree should be a minimum of 32 inches in circumference that's around the trunk and this tree is not so we will not be tapping this tree and likewise while this tree is big you can see that this tree is not healthy and we will not be tapping this tree one characteristic common to box elder is they are a multi-trunk tree sometimes and we are measuring here to see how many of these trees we can tap next we're going to drill and we're actually going to drill two holes in the same place we're just drilling a pilot hole so we're not going in with such a huge drill bit and we want that to be the same size as the spile that we're using then we just went ahead 
and hooked up our hosing and put our buckets there. And you can see that after the first drill, it was already leaking syrup. Well, sap, because it's not syrup yet. So here we are. This tree has three taps. And then we just went ahead and went to the other trees that we wanted to tap and inserted the drill, inserted the spile, and put the hose into the buckets. And what happened next? Well, we hit a warm spell and the sap quit running. And here I was just about to show you that all of the buckets had less than a half an inch of sap in them. And so we had zero sap to work with. I even took just a quart size jar out with me so I could show you this is how much sap we got. And that was going to be the end of our video because that's what happened. But what happened overnight while I was waiting to go out to film that part of the video was that the sap started running like crazy. We had a really cold night. It got down into the 20s and the sap just started running like crazy. So I'm going to evaluate the sap here and just take a look at it and how clear it is and how great it looks. So yes, it looks like it's able to be used. And I'm just going to empty all the buckets and show you how much I ended up with in just overnight in a cold spell. And yes, that was Bear, that little bitty puppy. He is now over 50 pounds and growing like a weed. So here I am with my sap. I have a half of three quarters of a bucket and then I have this full bucket. So I'm gonna just start practicing. I know this isn't enough, it's gonna warm up. So I'm just gonna go ahead and go through the process of making the syrup just because I don't want this sap to go to waste and I wanna pin down the process so that later I can do it. So I've strained some sap and now I'm using this short roaster because research was telling me that that was key. It evaporates and boils down faster. If you have a shorter pan that's not as deep, so I have this other roaster that I'm also gonna use. And both of these roasters were holding a gallon. These jars that I have strained and cleaned out some of the debris using cheesecloth in, those jars are about a half gallon each. So each one holds a gallon. Now I also have this pan, which is going on the back burner and I'm just gonna heat and just go from one pan to the next. Next part of the process is as the sap starts to evaporate, all of the things that are in the sap, and the sap contains so many different things brought from nature, minerals and salts and things like that. And those will foam up and get on the top. So we're gonna go ahead and use a skimmer and skim them off. Now you can see just how fast this is evaporating. So I'm just gonna go ahead and keep up the process of what I was doing and just add one pan to the next pan and just keep that process going. So that one pan is always full and the next pan is warming up. Now you can see that it's evaporated all the way to the bottom of this pan. I'm gonna switch it to this pan that is a little less lengthy so that it's deeper in the pan overall. And I'm gonna let that evaporate for a few minutes. And once that has evaporated to where it's too low to judge how it's coming together, 
I'm going to strain it again with, with cheesecloth and then I'm going to finish it off in this pan. And you can see here that even though I've strained it again, there's still a little debris left behind. So straining it often is a good idea. Now this little machine here measures the thickness and it measures the uh, sugar content. And so if it goes down in real slow, that tells you there's a number, it's called a brick score, that tells you when it's ready. It wasn't ready, so I boiled it down, did it again, and that took about another 20 minutes because you can see that we were really close. And you can see here that it's just going down in so very slow. You can see how thick it is. And it goes down in and then it comes back up, floats up a little bit more. And this little machine is called, um, I'll link it down below so you get the spelling of it. And that measures your, your sugar content. Now I knew guys that having this much sap wasn't gonna amount to very much syrup because it takes about 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of syrup. And I had a little over a gallon. But within the next day, all of these were full. It was the weekend. We got out the turkey cooker and hooked up some gas. And we did this process the same way all day long, except we did it outside and just kept adding to it and letting it evaporate adding to it and letting it evaporate until we were ready to bring it into the house and finish it that way. Now we're in the final stages. We're in the house and we have a measurement of 216 degrees outside. So we know we just have a few more degrees to take this sap and continue to evaporate it and get it to the point that we want it to be, which is about 219 degrees. And you can see that we're just boiling away and it smells so good. It smells so sweet and so caramel and mapley. And even though this is box elder sap, it still has that mapley syrupy smell as it boils and it just fills the house and it just smells so good. And here we are at the final stage as you can see that the boiling has really changed over and now we're ready to bottle our sap. I've heated our jars so that they're nice and warm and I've went ahead and put the cheesecloth on one more time and we're straining it into this thick rich wonderful syrup. It tastes so good and I am so excited that we are a little late to the game and we finished off at the end of the season but we have two pints of maple syrup to last us until next year. We did learn so much and we're so ready for next year and I was able to cross this homesteading goal bucket list off our list and I'm so excited. So thanks so much for watching guys. Here are a few more videos that you might enjoy watching. Until next time guys, be blessed, be safe, and I'll see you 